we've got in, uh, you know, we, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ every year about the same time of year, you know. And so I'm going to go over why and how we ended up to that point, and then And then uh, I'll cover a few things next service and next service leading up to that point. We don't have two more, right? So in Exodus chapter 12, follow me in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. How, how do, biblically, how do you determine the first day of the month or the first month? You know, do anybody know how to, how do you get to the first month in the Bible? So you've got, you got to have a new moon and you got to have the, the barley has got to be green in the sheaves. So it's got to have green barley, which they, they tell that it's able to be baked and eaten. You know, so that's the earliest it could be harvested to the point where it could be baked and eaten. So you got to have a new moon and you got to have green in the sheaves. And that's, that's where they get this month. It's the month of Abib is, is the first month of the Bible. That's in uh, Exodus 9, 31. Describes all that, how they get to that. But just so you know, it isn't, you look on the calendar, it's, oh, oh, it's uh, April 17th. That's how we're going to figure out how this is. Now, there's several things that have to come into alignment for this to happen first. And if, if you land on a new moon and the barley isn't ready, you skip a month. You, go the, you add another 30 days. So they could have a 360-day calendar or they could have a 390-day calendar. Either or. So it follows the cycles of the moon. So, so if you've got a new moon, what do you get 14 days after the new moon? A full moon. Okay? We're all on the same page there. So, so this is, says, here's the beginning of the month. This is the first month of the year. In verse 3, it says, Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month, it's important, tenth day of the month, they shall take unto them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for their house. And then it says, What kind of lamb? It says, If the household be too little for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to their number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So, so if you can't afford the lamb, you get with your neighbors who can. Because it's important that you all have a lamb together. Okay? And you go to their house, you're going to spend the night at their house. Because it's going to be a, be a big ordeal, a big feast that you're going to have. And you're all going to share a lamb. So in... Verse 5, it says, The lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it from out of the sheep or from the goats. So it can be a goat or a sheep, but it's got to be a lamb without blemish. And further on, you look in you look into Scripture and it says, whenever they celebrated this in Jerusalem, they had what they call the sheep gate. And the, the priest, would, whenever people would come from afar and bring their sheep, it had to be examined. Because if it wasn't a lamb without blemish, if it had something wrong with it, if it had a spot in the wrong spot or, you know, a deformity in its teeth or something, it wasn't counted. You'd have to go sell it and trade it off and get a lamb that was good for your sacrifice. Okay? And this is, a, this is all leading up to a picture of Jesus because he has become our perfect sacrifice. He is the lamb without blemish, blemish never sinned, never had a spot of sin upon him. Never sin. Never sin. If you have a Savior that sinned in some way, shape, or form, then he's not the Savior. He wouldn't be a lamb without blemish. He had to be a perfect, sinless saint, Savior, or else he wasn't the Savior. So verse 6, he says, You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. That would be full moon. So you got a, you got a light to work by. You know, if you're... These, there's three feasts in the Bible that you that they were designated. You had to travel all the way to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast there in Jerusalem, the Passover being the number one. This is a big one. So how great did God plan this out? And now you get to travel by a full moon. Great. God's going to give you a life to travel by. So it's the 14th day of the same month. So you got the first day is a new moon, 14 days in, a full moon. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. What's, what's the evening? How, what happens when it becomes evening? 
the sun goes down. That's right. To kill it, kill it in the evening. And it says they shall take the blood of it. This is real important and really cool. You know, I want you all to pay attention to see this. They shall take the blood of it and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. The two side posts and the upper door posts. What's that look like? Oh. You think that, do you think God had the cross in mind way back here? You know, almost 1,500 years prior to Jesus being sacrificed? He had the cross in mind on the two door posts and on the lintel above. On the two door posts. On the, where, where's the blood? Where is the blood? You know, does it... Does it carry me meaning that Jesus had the crown of thorns on his head and bled and that, it, that he had pierced in his hands? Does it carry meaning? Absolutely carries meaning. And it was deemed to be so way back before there was even a Roman Empire that was going to do this. God knew what he was taking care of. So, so it says and they, in verse 8, They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast it with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. And this is all a picture of what we say is communion. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's all a picture of communion. And it says, Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast it with fire, his head with legs, and the pertinence thereof. Ye shall let nothing of it remain until morning. And that which remaineth of it in the morning, ye shall burn it with fire. So all, all of this is a picture of Jesus that, G, that God set in motion a long time ago, and He's and He's fulfilled it in Christ. So now, so, but I want you to keep keep the uh, the Passover in mind as we go over it this week, as we lead up to it next week, as we see what what's going on and how. How Jesus is the fulfillment. And so we're going to plug in some more puzzle pieces to see how this all came about and how it came to be. So in in chapter 26, Matthew, and Sheila's going to like this. Because that's what her Bible study was. She has a women's Bible study over at Park Place. It's, apparently it's phenomenal. I've seen her notes, and it's really good. <laughs> but, but chapter 26, it, it says, verse 1, It came to pass when Jesus... Had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So he's put in the same day, feast of Passover, crucifixion of Christ. Same day. Right? And then, verse 3, Assemble together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted they that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. But did they sacrifice him on the feast day? Absolutely. Was there an uproar? Not so much. Not so much. And if you remember right, they, they said for, for Barabbas, which his name means son of a father, Barabbas. They said they released Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And all of the crowd yelled out, crucify him. Crucify him. Let's have let's have the the awful criminal, the murderer, released. And this sacrifice the sinless Savior who's done no wrong. No sin whatsoever. So, so Jesus says this, and now we're going to look back. We're going to we're going to take a snapshot. He's going to he's going to take a look what happened a few days prior, four days prior actually, and look and see what what is leading up to this point where the where these Pharisees got to the point where they hated Jesus so much that they wanted to kill him, and what they did to get into that process. Because what would, what would we have if, if they didn't want to kill Jesus? Would we have had a crucified Savior? Would we have had all of these prophecies fulfilled? Would we have any of that? Would we, you know, you wouldn't have needed a Judas, would you? If they had not had it in their heart already that they wanted to kill the Savior. So, so in verse 6, it's, it's backing up four days. And he says, now when Jesus was in Bethany... In the house of Simon the leper. So Bethany and Jerusalem is right next to each other. 
in the house of Simon the leper. Now this is very key. Whose house are you in? Simon the leper. What is Jesus doing in a leper's house? <laughs> right? It's forbidden, you know. Unclean, unclean. You can't you're not even supposed to get around him. And I would assume, you know, it, you know what they say when you assume, so I don't want to say anything, but my, my opinion, let me put my opinion out there. I think that Simon used to be a leper. Hmm. And he was one of those that Jesus healed. But how many of us, even even though we've been cleansed by Christ, that uh, name still follows us around, right? That who we used to be, we still have the consequences of who we used to be, right? We, that we have to live with. And I, I kind of think that's what's going on in here. But he's in the house of Simon the leper in Bethany. That's a very key clue there. And then verse 7. In this same house, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he set it meat. Wow. So she's anointing his head. While he's eating, he's sitting at the table to eat, and this woman takes a, 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 a box made of alabaster, very precious, very pricey, and she pours it out, not on herself, but on the Savior. And talk about an uproar. This is going to cause problems. But as, as Sheila pointed out yesterday when she was talking about this, she says, so this, this woman, if you read another scripture, says she, it says she was a whore. And whores use perfume to cover up the smell. So she's taking this perfume and poured it out not on herself, but on the Savior. Not to cover up her smell, but to anoint him for burial, as we're going to see. Verse 8, when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose was this waste? Why are you doing this? Don't you know what this is worth? For the, for my, verse 9, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now we're going to see in another verse that there's a specific disciple that's saying this. In verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work among, among me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. So what happens to a body after a day or two? Starts thinking. So she, before he's even dead, She's preparing him for his burial. She knew something that the rest of them did not get yet. That he had to go and be crucified. That he had to go and lay down his life for the sin of the whole world. For my sin. For your sin. For everybody's sin. He had to be dead, crucified, and buried. And then resurrected three days later. But she did this for his burial. It was not a waste. It had a purpose. In verse 13, Verily, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial for her. Wow, that's, that's pretty significant, Jesus. Wherever the gospel is preached, we need to include the story about this woman and who she is and what she's did. Now, I, I, and you all know, probably know this. I love looking at all the accounts. Drawing together the whole picture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can read about this and how you fit it all together gives you a picture of who this woman is, where they were, what was going on, and who it was, this disciple, that made such an uproar. So if you, if you turn with me, for time's sake, and go to um, John 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 12. Because John's going to give us some clues that, that Matthew didn't give. And you're going to see some things that's going to make you go, oh, wow, this is something, something else, right? And it just, I, I love seeing things, God revealing things in Scripture that I've never seen before. You know, it, it gets me excited. Good. Well, you know, I've read it a million times. I've seen through it. I've been over it. I've been over it. I've been over it. And then all of a sudden, boom, God hits you with something that's like brand new. So you, How is it brand new? Because I've read it a million times. So that's the living word of God. Mm. And he does that. And it's amazing. And if you're not digging into your Bible to, to read it and, and see what God has in store for you, you're missing out on so very much. 
So this this leads us, you know, fills in some gaps. And verse one said, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was. So you know what happened to Lazarus, right? Everybody knows the story about Lazarus? Yeah, dead four days and he stinketh. That's what it says. Stinketh. Where Lazarus had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and it says, So Lazarus is there. Okay? Jesus and his disciples are there. And there they made him a supper. And Martha served. Okay? Very interesting. What where does Matthew say that they are? Matthew says they're in Simon the leper's house. And here we have in Simon the leper's house is also Lazarus. And Martha is serving. Why would Martha be serving? He said, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So this is not the last supper. We see why are they all sitting on one side of the table? Nobody knows. <laughs> They're not, you know, there was no chairs back then. They didn't even sit that way, just, just saying. But then, then it says, and then took Mary... Mary. Mary. Who's Mary? Sister to Lazarus and Martha. They it says they're in Simon's house in Matthew. So you've got Simon's house, Mary <coughs> serving, or Martha serving, Mary, and Lazarus. It's almost like a family gathering, isn't it? So they took Mary a spike not a took a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of ointment. Then said one of his <clears throat> disciples, Judas Iscariot. This is where Judas comes in. What, what would drive Judas <clears throat> to the point of betraying his Savior? You ever tried to fill in the blank there? So Jude, imagine Judas. Think about Judas. Judas walked with him. Talked with him. He was called of him to be a disciple. He was a disciple. Called an apostle by Jesus. He went out. When Jesus sent the twelve out to go heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, Judas was right there with him. When Jesus sent out the seventy to go heal the sick, cast the dead, cast out demons, Judas was with him. He came back. He was one of them. Judas was there at the Sermon on the Mount. Judas was there whenever... Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. Judas was there through all this. So how in the world could you, I can't fathom, how would Jesus, Judas turn against Jesus? It's hard to imagine. And I know there's stories made up and there's even a movie that's made up of all about why Judas betrayed Jesus, but it's not really found in Scripture exactly why. But but we can, uh, sometimes we get to use our imagination. Sometimes God fills in some blanks for us. Sometimes we see things that we've never, ever seen before. So, so it starts off here that Judas, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Whose house are they in? Simon the leper's house. Why didn't it mention that Judas is Simon's son? Whose house is he in? <laughs> Simon's house. Huh. Why did they make mention that Judas is Simon's son? Because he's in his father's house. <gasps> Fill in some blanks. <laughs> he's in his father's house. He's, he's in, a, in a place that, that would call for some respect, right? And it says at the tables, you've got Lazarus sitting at the table. You've got Martha serving. Why would Martha be serving? Another good question. Why would Martha be serving? But, but this is a house, if, if you're in your father's house, you, you, you have some lot of respect. It's, it's your house too, right? Right? And if, you, if, you, if your father was alive and you went, went into your father's house, you could go right in the refrigerator and open it up and probably get you something to drink, could you? Without even asking. Right? You, you probably had a place you could probably lay down for a nap without even asking. And you could, because it's, it's your father's house. 
And there's safety in your father's house, but there's also respect in your father's house. So, so Jesus, so saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. He says, why was this ointment, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And then, now we see why he said this. You, you kind of think Judas was kind of a good guy up till now, right? You know, he, he did all these amazing things for Jesus and, you know, he's one of his disciples. But then, then he, said, and he says this, why don't we take this ointment and sell it for money? And give it to the poor instead of pouring it on your head and on your feet. And then verse 6, here we have a big clue. He says, this he said not that he cared for the poor. He didn't give a rip about the poor people. He didn't care about any of that. He said he didn't care for the poor, for the poor but because he was a thief. And had the bag and bear what was put in. Think about it. For Jesus' ministry, Judas is the one that is holding the bag. He's the treasurer of the group. Right? He's the one that has it all under control. And he was dipping into the kitty. And taking what was designated to be spent for the poor. And he was taking it for himself. He was taking it for himself. So he was a... Thief. That's what we call someone who steals. He was a, it says, plain as day. He was a thief. Wow. So you, you, so you got to think about what, what would lead, what would take Judas to it. At the very moment, it says, Satan entered him. And Jesus said, go do what you must do. And Satan entered him and took control of him so that he would go and betray Jesus. Unfathomable to me, but but he started betraying Jesus long before he did it at the Passover, long before long before he did it when he went up on on the Mount of Olives after Jesus was praying. Judas was already betraying Christ. He was already stealing from him. He was already already taking. You know, you, you see this on the news, and I know it's horrible that you know people they give it in this ministry and. And people waste the funds and, you know, spend it on lavish vehicles and, and all these things and that they shouldn't be so. And then you see, well, they, you know, they've embezzled money and, you know, even more so. And they've done this wrong and they've done that wrong. And that's horrible. But this is Judas who was in the presence of Christ every single day. How many of you have asked yourself, well, how, how would Jesus allow this to happen? Judas had a plan. Jesus had a plan for Judas. Jesus, all knowing, omniscient is the big word. He knew the end from the beginning. He knew what Judas was going to be. He knew when he chose G Judas to follow him, he knew eventually this one was going to turn against me. Not only turn against me, but he's going to betray me. Not only betray me, but he's going to steal from me. And yet, I have to use him. He has to come in there. He has to be a player in the game. He has to be the one who's eventually going to, going to take his own life. Because Jesus knows, knows the end from the beginning. He knew, he knew all about Jesus. He knew, he knew Judas in his heart. Verse 6 again. He said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put in. Or put therein in this verse 7. Then said Jesus, Let her alone against the day of my burying, has she kept this, for the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. So this there's a purpose to this alabaster box. There's a purpose to this spikenard <coughs> expensive ointment. There's a purpose to this Judas, this betrayer. There's a purpose to it all. How does, how does this fit in with the whole picture? How many of you, I know everybody here probably claims to be a follower of Christ. I know before 
God got a hold of me. I claim to be a Christian. But nothing in my life reflected that I was a Christian. Judas stole, you know, from the purse of Jesus' ministry. Why bad is that? Well, when we look at that, so that's, all, that's completely awful. But really, it's no better than what we do against Jesus. It's no better, no worse. We're in the same situation, the same state, when we sin against God. And we, we take the, the gift that he's given us of salvation, and we're going to read more about the crucifixion, and how awful <coughs> that was, and how despicable, and how despised he was, and how hated he was. And we have Judas for 30 pieces of silver, for a little money, a little riches. He's going to exchange the life of the Savior. What do we exchange for serving Jesus completely, fully, and wholly? Entirely. What would I change? We sang the song, I surrender all. But yet, what are we holding tight to that we won't let go of because this seems to be more important than serving Jesus? How, how are we much different than Judas? We may not be stealing from Jesus, but we may be stealing the time that we should be devoting to Jesus. Our, our, our finances that we should be devoting to Jesus, our love and devotion that we should be devoting to Jesus, we're stealing that for our own self, selfish pleasures. Just like Judas. How much of a difference is there? But we shouldn't end up in the same way, in the same state that Judas was. Judas saw that he'd done wrong. He knew that he'd done wrong, but he did not seek the forgiveness of the Lord. He, he couldn't deal with his pain and his agony and his, and his regret. And instead of taking it to the right place and taking it to Jesus, which he had ample opportunity to do, he took his own life. Not seeing the, the rightful escape of what should have been running to the feet of the Savior said, God, forgive me. Because he said, he said to those to those Pharisees when he went and he took the money back and he threw it back at them and it scattered and he said, said I've sent an innocent man to his death. And he realized what he had done. Will you come to the conclusion to realize what you have done against the Savior? Will you think about what I'm missing out on by giving my all, by giving my everything, not holding anything back, not doing anything on the side, on the slide, nothing in the secret, because nobody, none of the other disciples said, "Hey, Judas, where are you going with that money bag? What are you doing with that?" They, he had them all fooled, but he didn't fool God. God knows. God knows all about us too, doesn't he? Amen. So if, if, if you take anything away from Judas, what do we say? If you, if you point the finger, when you have three more, point back at you. Right? And it's real easy to point the, point the finger at Judas. Man, he's awful and he's despicable and terrible. And I can't believe Judas would do that. But we need to go, what have I done against the Savior? What have I done? Think about today. What am I going to do today to please my God? And say, Lord, I surrender all. You're wholly mine. And I want to be wholly yours. Completely, nothing left out. The old uh, Rock of Ages says, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. And that's what it means. That's, that's it. That's what we have to do, amen? That's all it requires of us, is everything. 